Friends, welcome here. We're going to actually try something interesting and start on time, right at 7 p.m. as the uh, folks start coming in um, virtually. Welcome to the impact of technology on relationships should we worry with Dr. Carol Brees. My name is John Martins. I direct the Center for Christian Engagement here at St. Mark's College. I want to offer thanks and some gratitude as I welcome you, I'd also like to welcome the Mus the, um, to thank the Musqueam people for their welcome to us. The land on which we gather is a traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and we're thankful for their welcome so that we can live, learn, and pray on their land. For those who don't know, the Center for Christian Engagement is a center at St. Mark's College that emphasizes the importance of listening, reflecting, learning, discussing, and praying as we explore the Christian and Catholic intellectual tradition and seek to learn from others. St. Mark's Center for Christian Engagement seeks to enable the creation of a culture of encounter and dialogue by creating, by creating an opportunity to address the challenges associated with the disengagement for many people from the church and the life of faith. We're very thankful to the people who support this work, Mark and Barbara Cullen, for their generous support of the lecture series here at the Centre and of the colleges. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our donors to the Centre for Christian Engagement, whose generosity enables this work to take place. Peter Bull, Angus Reed, and Andy Zox helped to found this Centre, and we're thankful to their commitment for the life of the academic world and the work of the church in the world. And as I said, we're thankful for those of you who are here with us today in person and for those who are joining us virtually. This evening, we're very pleased to have Dr. Carol Brees. And as I mentioned, her talk, The Impact of Technology on Relationships Should We, Should we Worry, is going to be dynamic. Carol is a professor emeritus of communication, formerly the director of family studies at the University of St. Thomas, Minnesota. For three decades, she's been a professor, researcher, author, and relationship social scientist, passionate about how humans create healthy relationships through micro moments of interaction and ritual. And particularly interested, and I think this is of interest to all of us, on the impact of the digital age on in-depth listening, robust conversations, and human empathy. The author of five books and dozens of academic journal articles, Carol is a dynamic speaker. With a popular TED Talk, you can check this out online, Are All Relationships Messy? She recently, <laughs> yeah. she recently published a groundbreaking study exploring the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on relationships, exploring how couples navigate the COVID-19 pandemic using weefulness theory. You can learn more about Carol at www.carolbrees.com, including her TED.com articles, a CBC News series she co-created, Relationship Reboot, her sewing shenanigans, and efforts to train her Bernadoodle, George, as a therapy dog best wishes. Um, she and her husband of 31 years, Brian Brees, who is the president of the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in Minnesota, are currently living on the campus of St. Ben's in St. Joseph, Minnesota. They have two young adult children, one in LA and another in New York. You've got all the coast covered and the middle. Um, in her free time, she enjoys doing headstands, sewing with vintage fabrics, and learning teen slang. You'll have to help us out. She asks, are our daily tech choices resulting in disintegrating conversations, distracted brains, and reduced human empathy? If so, how should we respond? Let's find out. Please welcome Dr. Carol Brees. Those long introductions, so sweet, thank you. Um, sort of a meta conversation tonight, right? Because I'm talking to all of you out there in the virtual world and all of you here in this room. And uh, I get a little loud, so luckily we have tech help here so we can adjust. Um, 
It's also really hard to stay contained at this podium. So normally I'd be out there working with you, but I've been told I can't do that because we want to engage our, our Zoom audience. So we're gonna do the best we can keeping me in my place. Um, John Martins, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Martins and I have been friends for a long, long time. Thank you, Center for Christian Engagement. Um, this topic that we're going to talk about tonight is so central to our humanity. Conversation is the most human and humanizing thing we do. And so I just want to thank you for caring about this topic. Um, and uh, thank you for having me. This is my first time in Vancouver, and I just let my husband know I might not come home. <laughs> 31 years of marriage, I said you can move on up. Um, but what an incredible place. So much of what I study um, are the little messages, those little moments in relationships that actually are the big things. As we like to say as relationship social scientists, relationships aren't made up of big things. They're a million little things. Um, and that a lot of this work, and I'll talk about um, this work tonight, comes from the Gottman Institute at the University of Washington, um, right down the road from here. I have a particular interest in our relationship superpowers. In fact, given my work and, and much of the work in this field, I believe that our greatest human superpower is our human connection and relationship to those around us. And not just the people we know well, not just our friends and our family and our partners and our spouses, but this truth that we change other people simply by being in their presence, by being in contact with others, whether we know them or, or not, whether they are strangers or are our closest allies. And what most of us don't yet know, you're gonna know a little bit more after this evening, is the specific how and why of this human relational superpower. Most of us don't have a clue the extent to which we not only impact others, but also the extent to which, and I brought this up here as a prop tonight, but also my timekeeper, the extent to which these little beautiful computers that almost all of us, over 90% of us, no matter our age, carry around with us, have, us within, have within arm's reach 24 seven. I asked the students at noon today, all right, how many of you sleep with these? Meaning, can reach it, can reach, you know, by lit down your arm. If I asked you all, how many of you sleep with your phone? I got some head nods, I got some people not responding, no? The majority of us, and we'll get to that later, sleep with it. But how much these are changing our face-to-face -face relationships. But hopefully in this next hour, you're gonna have a little better understanding about why I believe both as a human and a mother and a spouse and a friend and a daughter, but also as a relationship social scientist, why we are wise to reevaluate our relationship, especially with our smartphones. And we're gonna talk about how these are different than our laptops even our iPads, any other screens, but why we are wise to reevaluate our relationship with our technology so that we can nurture those relationships that are most important with other humans. So before we dive deep into what the research is telling us about the impact of digital technology on our relationships, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the context. The context about why we need to talk more about the impact of anything on our relationships. Because again, most of us have a sense of sort of general sense of how much good or bad, high conflict, low conflict um, relationships impact our well-being but the majority of us severely underestimate the impact they have, not only on our mental health, but on our physical health. And we now have more than 80 years of longitudinal data, and I'll, I'll 
cite that data later and I'll give you a little peek. I'm gonna give you some homework tonight too because what I'm gonna talk about tonight, it's a four credit full semester class. So I'm gonna give you a little homework. Like if you're like, oh, I wanna know more. I'll be like, go watch that, read this. We now have 80 years of longitudinal data and a whole host, a mountain of studies across the disciplines revealing the very specific connections between our physical health and the quality of our social connections and relationships. For instance, researchers have found that you are likely to live an average of 15 years longer if you are a person surrounded by a tightly connected circle of friends than a person who is not. Researchers of the longitudinal Harvard nurses study, has anyone ever heard of that study? I asked a group recently that and a woman said, I was, I'm in that study. Um, if you want to know more about that study, they actually have a really profound website, very accessible, that, that documents many of the findings. There's multiple iterations of the study. One of their fascinating findings was that the lack of positive relationships in your life is as bad for you as cigarettes and obesity. Researcher Dr. Sheldon Cohen at Carnegie Mellon University found, for instance, that the better or more positive a person's relationships and social network is, the less likely that person is to get the common cold. Actually, they did this series of fascinating studies where they, they found that people who actually received a lot of hugs and then were exposed to cold viruses, so of course we bring college students into the labs, we shoot cold viruses up their noses, we have them keep a diary of how many people they hugged in the last week. We found that those people who had less physical social contact, just the, you know, the, the friendly hug, it could be that person you see at the grocery store and you're like, hey, how are you doing? Those people were significantly more likely to get the common cold. Why do you think that is? You're like, is she really asking for, for I really want to do audience participation, but it's hard on Zoom. It's because one of the things we know is that loneliness, the lack of relationships, in addition to negative relationships, and we'll get into what that means, are this constant drip of stress, cortisol, adrenaline into our bloodstreams. And the, the opposite is true, that this human touch, this connection, it boosts our immune systems. It, it's a drip of the free good drugs that our body produces. One of the really interesting bits of research from the University of Washington, the Gottman Relationship Institute, that gets to this point so clearly, they were able to find in their longitudinal study of couples that by counting the number of contemptuous facial expressions made by husbands in heterosexual marriages, they were able to predict with accuracy the number of illnesses the wife would experience in that heterosexual marriage over the next four year period. Yeah, you just did it. Exact, good job. What's your name? name? Yeah, David. David just offered a, you're right. And good humor, right? Good humor, contempt, right? Rolling your eyes, the smirk, this. It came very naturally. Mm -hmm. We'll talk afterward. Okay, we'll talk afterward. We know that these kinds of micro expressions, right, have a significant physical impact, a physiological impact on us, the human receiver. One of my favorite contemporary sources on this complex, fascinating science from across multiple disciplines and it explains all of the above in very accessible ways, is Susan Pinker's book, The Village Effect. And she is summarizing here work from, again, across the disciplines, massive sort of meta-analyses of the data. She summarizes work of people like Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstedt, who did a whole host of series, series of studies herself, including tens of thousands of middle-aged people. And Lundstedt looked at 
every aspect of these middle-aged people's lifestyle, everything from exercise to diet, marital status, doctor visits, smoking, drinking, socioeconomics, quality of the air they breathe, size of their family, all of these variables. And she wanted to know, oh, and if you're interested, both the book and her TED Talk, so you can check that out, little homework. She wanted to know, over time, what are the best predictors um, of how long people would live? Was it clean air? No. Was it getting your blood pressure treated? Okay, but not best predictor. Are you overweight? Do you exercise? Do you get your flu shot? Have you quit drinking and quit smoking, moderated? Getting closer to the best predictors. The top two predictors of how long we'll live were, number two, the quality of your close relationships. How do we define that? How does she define that? Defined as those people you could call for a loan, those people who would sit with you while you mourn the loss of a dog or a partner, or who would take you to a doctor's appointment. Second mo predictor, what was number one? If this was number two, what do you think was number one? Audience participation. What do you think? Genetics, maybe? Any others? What's that? Broader community. What do you mean? People, yeah, people you see that. Okay, we're getting warmer. What's your name? Carmen. Carmen. Carmen's getting close. Number one predictor of how long we'll live is this thing called social integration. It was a surprise to Lundstedt, it was a surprise to Pinker, who found almost identical things in her global research, this thing called social integration. Basically, how much do you talk to the people and interact with the people around you face to face as you move about your day? And again, not just the people we care about, not just family members, spouses, but do you talk to the person, whoops, do you talk to the person who's making your coffee? Are you members of a group who gather once a month to learn, um, make the world a better place? Are you part of a book club? Do you stay after church and talk to your, your fellow congregants? Do you get together with neighbors? Do you talk to the person in the grocery line? Do you learn a, a little about the person who works out at the same time as you? Those interactions, those were the strongest predictor of how long you'll live in this study with tens of thousands of participants. Stronger than quitting smoking, losing weight, or getting to the doctor. And what Pinker does in her book is she sort of unpacks the science of this, helping us understand these powerful connections between health and social connection, the power of our relationships. And we can get a lot of clues in the loneliness research, right? Like we know, according to the British epidemiologist Andrew Steptoe, you might have heard of him, he's sort of the loneliness guru, that feeling lonely exaggerates the inflammation in our bodies, our reactivity to stress, that are linked to all sorts of disease, while also interfering with our ability to retain facts, solve problems. As he says, feeling lonely is as painful as being, being wildly hungry or thirsty. A rich network, as Dr. Pinker says, a rich network of face-to-face -face relationships literally creates a biological force field against disease. And the key there is face-to-face. The neuroscience is becoming very clear that face-to-face -face interaction sparks far greater activity in the brain regions linked to social cognition and reward. It is linked to so many of the things that helps create this biological force field against disease. It doesn't just improve our mental health, it improves our overall health. It'll extend our lives by 15 years. And the good news is that micro changes can make 
all the difference. And some of those micro changes involve these beautiful little computers. And I'll give you a little alert. Micro doesn't always mean easy. Micro means small things with big impact and big import. So this is the part of the talk where we're going to go deep into the role of technology on our relationships. And I found it's always important to start with that why, right? To say relationships aren't just the secondary or third dairy thing. They are the thing. They are our God-given gift that we are in human relationships with others. And so we're going to dive into that for the remainder of our chat tonight. And I, I want to offer this one um, disclaimer. I am not anti-tech. Okay, one time I forgot to kind of do all this and I was speaking to a group of high schoolers and I thought I was going to be like one of those people in a mosh pit where they like lifted me up and carried me out of the room. Like, you know, because they were just like going to throw things at me. I love all my things, right? Like getting texts from my kids and I got a cute dog and I love it all. My iPad, my smartphone, my Apple Watch. I love tech. But I also am concerned because I'm a social scientist and the research is piling up. It has made me worried. As I said to the college students that, that I talked with at noon today, um, they are the ones who are giving me a lot of hope because they've become worried as well. And so they're changing our future. If ever, by the way, you are feeling a little down or out, spend some time with college students. You will feel so hopeful um, and so rejuvenated because they are our future leaders and change makers. But I'm a little bit concerned because I have been doing the research and reading the research. Um, and I do know that tech is awesome in so many ways. It changes lives, it saves lives, it can be a human connector, it can be entertaining. And I wanna actually begin um, before we dive into what some of the research is um, on why we should be worried, I want to share what I think was one of the most very convincing arguments about the life-giving nature of tech in our lives, even in our spiritual lives. And that argument comes from a friend of mine, a Minnesota colleague, De Dr. Deanna Thompson. Dr. Deanna Thompson was a professor of theology at Hamlin University for over two decades and is now serving as the inaugural director of the Lutheran Center for Faith, Values, and Community and the Martin E. Marty Regents Chair in Religion and the Academy at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. She's the author of many books. You can find her just by Googling Deanna Thompson. Deanna and I met as first year faculty member at Hamlin University over three, year, three decades ago, over three years ago, I wish. We were both brand new professors and brand new mothers. Those first babies of ours are living on the coast. They're all over the place, college graduates. Dr. Deanna Thompson was a woman who, before her life situation with stage four metastatic breast cancer, was full on anti-technology and a self-admitted skeptic of anything and everything virtual. One of Deanna's recent books that has captured broad attention is this one, The Virtual Body of Christ. You can actually listen to an entire lecture by her by just Googling Deanna Thompson, the 2017 Luther Seminary Reformation Festival. Um, and, and listen to her entire lecture if you're interested, because in this book and in this lecture, she discusses in such a compelling way how virtual presence of the hands and feet of Christ can indeed be life-sustaining and can indeed be a venue for ministering to others. And as she says, no, I'm not asking if Jesus would have used social media. But what she is doing now is profoundly helping churches and pastors and faith communities all over the US and beyond consider the ways that tech and social media can enhance their ministries and relieve suffering. 
And among many of her arguments, she tells the story of when other pastors who were skeptical and even snarky before re reading her work and hearing her testimonies came to then admit that they too have been transformed by her arguments, by her journey, by her theology, by her faith. And so I thought, let's listen to just a little snippet, less than two minutes, so you can kind of whet your appetite for her argument um, about the virtual body of Christ. Before December of 2008, I was with you all in your skepticism about online networked communities. Then I got sick, really sick. In a matter of months, I went from being a healthy 41-year-old professor, wife, and mother to a virtual invalid with a broken back, a stage four cancer diagnosis, and a grim prognosis for the future. To keep family and friends updated during the early days of the diagnosis, my brother created a Caring Bridge website. I tell people if I hadn't been on so much oxycodone at that time, I doubt I would have agreed to such a thing, being the self-righteous digital skeptic that I was. Once the site went live, news of my diagnosis spread quickly. Just as quickly, loved ones, friends, and even strangers signed up for updates on my condition. From my posts about what stage four cancer was doing to my body, to entries about the grief of having to resign from my very full and wonderful life, my cries were met not just with online posts, but also with emails, cards, packages, visits, calls from people from all corners of my life. It was shocking to realize that through virtual connectedness via a website, I was being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses greater than any I could have previously imagined. Growing up a Lutheran pastor's daughter, Lutheran pastor's granddaughter, Lutheran pastor's nieces, I have been, always been a fan of the local church and the way in which when the church is really being the church, it's a community that offers glimpses of the heavenly city where there will be no more crying, no more dying, only light, only love. It's a community present in profound and transforming ways with those who suffer. While members of my local parish have most certainly been the hands and feet of Christ in their ministry to me and to others in pain, over the past nine years, I have been awakened to a new, indeed almost mystical, understanding of the church universal and the healing effects it can have. This is not to say that before the internet, people were without the benefit of being surrounded by the body of Christ during the toughest times in their lives. But as Luther Seminary professor Rolf Jacobson has told me during our conversations about having cancer, he has said, I have had cancer both before digital media and after. In terms of how the media allows us to surround isolated people with the love and presence of Christ, it is way better to be sick in the age of digital media than before the age of digital media. This experience of being surrounded by the body of Christ with the help of the internet has prompted me to start thinking about this phenomenon of being ministered to online as none other than the virtual body of Christ. So just a Before little... December... It doesn't like to advance without playing again, so we'll just do that. Again, if you are interested in her brilliant work, um, you can look her up, her most recent book, Glimpsing Resurrection, Cancer, Trauma, and Ministry. It's really shifted in so many ways my own research um, and the way I think about and I'm more careful about my criticism of digital technologies. So I, I begin with those bits of context because yes, I believe that technology can be life-giving and relationship enhancing. It can build community. It can be the source of soul lifting entertainment and so much more. I believe that absolutely. And we now have enough credible data 
rolling in in the last eight to 10 years because we finally have enough data with these little screens and smartphones in our hands long enough to make some credible conclusions about the worrisome effects of, of our collective love affair with our devices. And I use the word love affair very intentionally. And again, this topic is a four credit course in and of itself. So I've picked for us to look at tonight what some of the best of the best research is and to sort of whet your appetite so that you might, as you walk out of here in 45 minutes or whenever we end um, and talk to each other about what we learned, you might decide some of the ways that you're going to reevaluate your relationship with technology. One of the things that we know, and I, I'm gonna cite the work of Dr. Sherry Turkle of MIT um, throughout the uh, next portion of this um, talk tonight. One of the things that we know is that technology has a powerful seductive undertow in all of our lives. And Dr. Turkle argues that technology saturation in our lives has been a little bit like climate change. Day to day, most of us feel safe in our life and our work. We might be noticing the subtle shifts around us, but we have a hard time fully processing how profound those shifts in our world might be. And for many people, especially people in certain parts of the world, there's a temptation to think that we can just go on the way that we are and everything will be okay. One of the things that Turkle points out in her research of all the changes in our social world, here is one truth that we cannot overlook. The fact that we rarely give each other our full attention anymore. And we've forgotten how unusual this has become. We've forgotten that almost all young people are growing up without ever having experienced unbroken conversations. That most of us has, have never experienced single tasking or unitasking ever. We're actually rewarded for this mythological notion of multitasking, which actually doesn't exist, right? It's our brain going back and forth really quickly between two things. And a lot of what I study, as you already know, is focused on our most intimate relationships, our families, our marriages, parenting, grandparenting, extended family, generational transmission of rituals. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about that. A few years ago, I uh, published um, by the way, I'm jet lagged, so I'm like, blah. Um, I published this 535 page edited volume on how technology is affecting family, couple, and parenting relationships. And you absolutely do not want to buy this book unless you're a grad student or a researcher because you'll be bored to tears. But one of the things I did as I was preparing to edit this book with 22 research teams from around the world is I kept a list of the things that made me go, Yikes, or made me really, really curious in the research. Some of the trends in the research that I thought we should pay attention to. And interestingly, the research from the pandemic, for instance, is just starting to pour in, to emerge. And we already have new words, right? New experiences create new words. Zoom both saved us and it isolated us. And we have new feelings about that and new words to express them. We're Zoom fatigued, there was Zoom bombing, right? There's a whole host of new words. And the study that John Martins mentioned that I published during the pandemic, which wasn't explicitly about technology, but it was about couples and how they were navigating um, this time. So we were studying them in situ, in the moment of what they were experiencing. It revealed what a lot of the other studies that are starting to be published about human relationships in the pandemic are also saying. And I'll give you the very brief summary that the couples who were struggling in their relationship before the pandemics, the pandemic was like water rushing through the, found, the cracked foundation. It heaved open the cracks that were there that maybe could be ignored before 
we were brought into this, these small spaces. Couples who were doing well before the pandemic, overall the pandemic was this positive container. A common theme was a couple started to turn toward one another face to face. Their lives slowed down. They reestablished rituals of face to face human connection back to the basics. They sat across from one another and had breakfast. They took walks together after dinner. They reimagined some of their rituals. They recognized that this pace that we had going before was not sustainable, that these distractions were killing them. And so in so many ways, they were saying, wow, our mediated interactions might not be serving us well. They enjoyed talking to each other, having lunch, playing cards. And so this research as a whole is why I believe we need to reevaluate our relationship with technology, that we have this collective love affair with our technology. For instance, studies show that many adults in the US in particular admit that they, quote, can't live without their technology. They literally say they can't live. 53% of millennials report that they would rather lose their sense of smell than lose their smartphones, than to have their smartphones taken away. A good one third of adult US Americans said that if they had to choose between sexual intimacy with their partner or spouse or having their smartphone for a year, they would choose their phone. I know, I see some old faces. What else are we telling researchers we'd be willing to give up for a year if we didn't have to give up our smartphones? Let me tell you, 55% said they would give up eating out. 45% said they'd give up going on vacation. More than 30% said friends. They would stop seeing their friends in person for a year if they didn't have to give up their smartphones. 46 said they would work an extra day each week to keep their phone. 70% said they would give up alcohol. 55% said they would give up caffeine. 63% said they would give up chocolate and 22% said they would give up their toothbrush. Other things that uh, adults said that they would give up, they'd give up their car, their TV, their pet. John and I are dog lovers, we're like, never. They'd give up shampooing for a week and they'd give up cheese. I grew up in Wisconsin, so these people were clearly not from Wisconsin. Given all that, these statistics should not surprise most of us. The average adult checks their phone every six and a half minutes. Approximately two thirds of us check our smartphone within five minutes of waking up. Most teens and young adults send an average of 100 texts per day. We adults attend to our digital devices around 150 times a day. And if you don't believe me, I actually encourage you, this is a great little bit of homework. Take one day and do a little diary study. Take note of how many times you attend to a digital device. And attend to is a quick look at, a touch, a glance, a peek, a just attending to you're going to quickly realize that um, the number is probably more than 150 times a day. 50% um, of smartphone users say they sleep with their phones. Actually, more recent data suggests it's much higher than that. 70% check their phone even when it has made no noise to indicate that a message or a voicemail or a retweet has happened. 23% of individuals admit that when in public spaces, 
they at least occasionally use their phone to avoid interacting with others who are near them. I know, I might have done that once. 27% of smartphone users say that they use their apps on their phone continuously. And what this all adds up to, when we look at our collective love affair with our smartphones, it adds up to us adults collectively engaging with our smartphones 8 billion times a day. Interestingly, when the Pew Research Center asks us about our bottom line judgment about the role of digital technology in our lives, the vast majority of us say it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And if we had a full four-hour class tonight, we'd have a whole discussion about this. And I had a fascinating discussion with the students today, a few of them who are here today. And, and they pointed out some of the good things, but also shared many of their concerns. According to Pew Research, on this love affair, this collective love affair with our phones, we now know that 39, almost 40% of adults say that they have a symbiotic relationship with their phones. Symbiotic, a relationship of mutual dependence. They use words similar to the words they use to talk about the people they love the most. They talk about their phones and what these devices mean to them with those same words, affinity, affection, um, serving needs. And we know now that the reason we love these devices is because they make us feel really good. Research shows that we're creating an, creating an actual emotional bond with our phones. We see our phones as extensions of selves, as appendages to our bodies. We actually have phantom buzzes and rings if you always keep your device in, your sa in the same pocket or backpack. We actually like, will often reach there even when it doesn't buzz um, because our brains are rewiring. The nucleus accumbens, the reward center of the brain, is where, when we interact with, attend to these devices, we get a little hit. We get a little mm in our bodies. The neurochemical high that we get from those buzzes and notifications and likes and retweets is similar, according to the research, to taking a hit of cocaine. According to University of Chicago Booth School of Business, Twitter is more addicting than cigarettes. The feeling you get from checking Twitter creates the same temporary high or buzz as a cigarette break. That's why I'm not on Twitter, John. That's why I just spend all my time on Instagram and TikTok. Well, let's talk about people in social situations. Dr. Turkle's research and research from Pew Research, among others, reveals a lot about tech in our social lives. About 90% of smartphone owners say that they used their phone during their most recent social gathering, like just hanging out with friends. And indeed, many of them admitted and said it was positive for them. They shared photos, they looked things up, they enjoyed cute dog TikToks. But when asked what they thought bringing the device into the conversation did to their conversation, when it came to the bottom line question, what do you think it did to human conversation? 82% of participant, participants admitted that it deteriorated the conversation. Dr. Turkle, in her research, found something that I mentioned to the students earlier today, found a fascinating phenomenon. This new implicit social rule called the rule of three. And what she found is she did her anthropological observation, in-depth interview studies with college students. She said that what college students have learned to do, and many of us are now doing it in our workplaces as well, and in other spaces, is that when we are around a table, let's say having dinner together, what college students identified as this rule of three is that they'll look around, and if at least three heads are up, 
appearing to listen, then you can look down and engage your device. What college students admitted is that when you, you wait for three people to have their heads up before you put your head down to your phone, so you make sure that some kind of conversation persists. As Dr. Turkle writes in her book, people admit it's not the same kind of conversation they'd have if everyone were paying attention. And experimental evidence backs them up. One of the most fascinating bits of research I've read and come across, also summarized in Dr. Turkle's uh, work, is this finding. If there is a digital device on the landscape when people are in conversation, and this digital device can be one where we say, Kevin and I are out to lunch, and we're like, oh, Kevin, it's good to see you. Oh, I got my phone, but I, I turned it off, and I'm gonna turn it off, and you're like, I'm put mine on do not disturb mode. We set them aside, but they're still on the landscape. The research shows that if there is a digital device visible in the landscape and two humans or multiple humans are in conversation, it will significantly reduce the chance that the people talking will talk about something of consequence, something that demands empathy. I know, it's a wow, right? Why do you think that is? Talk to your neighbor for, for 20 seconds. Zoom people, talk to someone or talk to yourself. Why do you think that is? Why will it reduce the chances that we'll talk about something that would require empathy? You know the answer. <clears throat> Audience is talking to one another. What do you think? In a, so could be an escape, uh, an escape route. Interesting. What were you saying? They don't want to. They don't. But why don't they want to go there? The question is why. What do you think? Yeah, in the back. try to summarize for the people who are on Zoom, so m slowing down to talk, right, in depth is a different kind of mode. I might be doing a bad job summar paraphrasing. And, and so this is a reminder that we have a different mode? Is that kind of what you're saying? It's triggering us to keep in that mode. What the research, I, I, I'm, I think you might all be on to something, what the research, what these researchers found is that actually we've been socialized to know that we'll likely get interrupted, that we will likely be put on pause because it's happened to all of us multiple times. I love the analogy that Dr. Turkle brings up. She says, if you're in a conversation at lunch with someone, would you pick up a book and say, excuse me, I'm just going to finish this chapter. I'm just going to, I was really into this before we got here. I'm just going to check this, right? No, but all of us know the experience of, no, I'm listening. Yep. Just one more email, right? And when we are put, whoop, this is my timekeeper. It's my prop, damn my timekeeper. When we are put on pause, we feel devalued, right? We feel less than human. And so when there is a device on the landscape, even when our conversational partner says, oh, I'm not gonna check it, I have it off, I have, we're less likely to go to this place of our deepest humanity because we don't want that feeling, again, of being put on pause. Speaking of pausing, let's talk about funerals for a second. This is Sherry Turkle again. As you can tell, I love her book, and I have a slide with her book um, that'll come up in a bit. 
One of the things that she found is that people text at funerals. They admit happily to texting at funerals. And she says, and I quote, we're living in an environment where we're doing something that's putting us in conflict that is not really helping community and friendship. We text during funerals. We text during religious services of all sorts. And when Dr. Turkle asks people, why do you do that? They admit, they say it. Well, we only text during the boring bits of the funeral or the religious service. She goes on to question with exasperation, I think it justified, the funeral texters. What does it mean for somebody to say, well, I went to a funeral and when it got boring, I texted? What have they forgotten about the purpose of a funeral? Did they forget that the point of a funeral is just to be together with the other people who are there? If I were thinking ahead, I'd bring back up that brain image again, right? Zing, zing, zing. Our brains have been rewired, and we're continuing to rewire them. I'm just checking my time. Dr. Brandon McDaniel is a research scientist at the Parkview Research Center in Indiana, where he is a family researcher and digital health educator. And he has been studying um, technology specifically as it interferes with family, parenting, and couple relationships. And in his research, he did his PhD at the University of Minnesota, he coined this new phrase called technoference. Some of his research found that 38% of individuals reported texting or sending emails during a conversation with their partners. Over 60% of couples reported that technology interferes in their couple leisure time at least once a day. That about a fourth of American adults report feeling like they have to answer a call even when it interrupts the family meal. And one of the things that he found when he was looking at this reality, that the bottom line of those realities, according to the research, is that the frequency of such interruptions is significantly related to lower life satisfaction, lower relationship satisfaction, and higher rates of depression. And this reality of the impact of technology on our family relationships is so fascinating. It reflects such a profound change in the landscape of families. It's now being considered by family and marriage therapists in a whole new way. Do we have any marriage and family therapists in the room by any chance? Darn it, because I was going to bring you up here to help me explain this. Two chapters, actually, in the edited volume that I shared with you a, a, a little bit ago um, actually address the way that therapists are shifting from seeing technology not merely as a tool of patterns of communication, but as members of the family itself. Yes, you heard that right, that therapists are starting to view our phones and our technology as family members. So they've introduced a new version of the long-used genogram. Many of you might be familiar with the family genogram. Family genograms have been used for a long time, a widely adopted tool to assess family interaction patterns. We now are using, I shouldn't say we, I'm not a therapist. I'm not patient enough to be a therapist. I just want to tell people what to do and not to do. I don't want to let you get to that yourself. So I'd just be like, eh -eh. like that new show Shrinking, is anyone watching it? Yeah, love it. I'd be that guy. I'd be like, stop that, start this. Um, marriage and family therapists are, have added this family technogram to help them assess, to see where this device, if seen as a family member, how it might help us assess what's going on. And one of the reasons this new tool is necessary, because it's not until the past two decades that at least three generations in a family have had the opportunity to engage in consistent digital technology use. And let's talk about family relationships and family use of technology. Most of us would think, most of us, and again, if we had a half an hour of discussion, I would get this out of you, but we would say and predict and think that it's the teens and adolescents who are the problem tech users, right? This is where you go, yes, right? They're not nodding, but I think they agree. You might guess 
It's the parents and grandparents who are complaining about the adolescents and the teens on phones. And do you know what's happening more and more often? And much of this research comes out of Dr. Turkle's work. I just want to give her proper credit. The research documents and reveals a large and growing discontent among children of all ages about their parents and their grandparents' use of phones and the inability to get their attention. What Sherry Turkle found, and I'm quoting her directly, children are begging their parents to put down their phones at dinner and elsewhere. One of the things, and this is Sherry Turkle, I kind of like build it up so you can finally see her. Um, and these are two of her books that I love. What Dr. Turkle explains in what she's observing in this flipped reality of kids and teenagers begging for their parents' attention. She does it brilliantly in this episode of National Public Radio's On Being. Are any of you familiar with this show? I love Krista Tippett. She's also a Minnesotan, so maybe I loved her. Once I was doing yoga next to her, she happened to be at the same yoga studio. She's got a really good exhale. Like a really deep exhale. But she interviewed Dr. Turkle in this episode where she explains so much. So I encourage you, this is a bit of your homework if you're interested in this. Just type in Krista Tippett on being Sherry Turkle and this episode will pop up. Where she talks about how technology has become the competition for children. To get the, the technology is the competition. And I was particularly struck by the depth of the angst and the awareness of children. So let's, let's listen in to just like a minute and a half here. But I think that for families as they grow up, I do feel strongly about this because really this, this dinner table thing has been such a theme mm -hmm. in my research, uh, such a theme as teenagers look back on their lives and what they miss. Hmm. It's teenagers who say, my parents text at the dinner table. <laughs> right, right. And there's, right. there's a story in my book. This, this young man has a mother who's a gourmet cook. So her pleasure is in making these long, long, many course meals, and that's how she shows her love for her family. And she's married to a kind of master of the universe, kind of Wall Street type guy. And he's on his Blackberry all through dinner. And their son starts to try to negotiate with the mother. Could she prepare shorter meals mm. so that then maybe the father would put away the Blackberry, but he's not going to do it if it's a four course meal. But maybe he would do it if it was basically just soup and salad. Or maybe he would do it if it was just salad and a grilled steak. And you, you know, you see a teenager trying to negotiate some way to get this blackberry out of the dinner table. And it's touching. Touching is one word for it. Right? It's that, think about that. Teens trying to negotiate to get more time, more eye contact from their parents. When in the history of ever has this happened? That teenagers want more attention from their parents. It's because something is missing. Right? I love this analogy, and I wish I could figure out who first wrote it. It's like we're all walking around with a sock half sliding off in our shoe, but we just keep walking, right? There's discomfort, but we don't really know how to get the sock back on. One of what Dr. Turkle suggests for all of us, especially the parents, the grandparents, the nannies, the caregivers, is that it's our job to create these sacred spaces like at the dinner table. We have to create these spaces. We have to model it. She talks about one of her favorite spaces. It's in the car where you say, no, we're not having devices in the car. The car is for either quiet contemplation or talking to each other. I don't care if you look out the window or talk to me, but we're not gonna be in our devices. 
And so the children and the teens who are in these kinds of families where there were rules created, where there were sacred spaces like the kitchen, no technology in the kitchen or no technology anytime we have any kind of food that we're serving or consuming, whatever that space is, that they appreciated it. Our students appreciate it when we have technology-free classrooms. They thank us for creating rules where we say, we are not going to use laptops, iPads, or not allow phones out. Because what we know is that those people who don't want it don't have the choice of the other people who do want it. And their brains don't have the choice but to go back and forth between the flashes and the clicks that they see out of the corner of their eye. So at, when we think about it, truly think about our days, that as we go about our days, time and time, hour after hour, day after day, and we think about that eight billion times when we have our eyes on our devices and not on each other, we have to start to ask ourselves, is it just a drop in the bucket? Or is it enough to consider this an oceanic shift in our humanity? One of the questions that comes up, and I'm gonna to begin to wrap up so we can have some time for dialogue and we're gonna take questions from our Zoom audience. One of the questions that comes up, and one of the things I've been very worried about is human empathy. How is this all impacting human empathy? How is this, this influx of digital technology in our lives, us looking at our devices, attending to our devices 8 billion times a day, what, how is this affecting our abilities to be empathic with each other? The news isn't great. Um, the research is suggesting that our over-reliance on devices is harming our ability to have valuable face-to-face -face conversations, the most human thing we do, in the words of Dr. Turkle. It's splitting our attention and diminishing our capacity for empathy. Guess how much it's diminishing our capacity for empathy? Researchers have been able to document a 40% decrease in empathy in the last two decades. And we were able to document this because there's a, a survey of human empathy that we've been giving to college students over the last 20 plus years, and we've been able to see and track how human empathy has declined. And we don't say that believe that human empathy is only declining among college age students, it's just we have the data from that age group. And although we can't know for sure the absolute cause, many research, researchers believe that reduced eye contact with others face to face is the key culprit. And we know that the most precipitous drop came in the years immediately after smartphones became ubiquitous. They were in the hands of almost all of us. I'm going to actually skip by this, and I'm going to share um, a study that I shared with the students today at noon. And the study went something like this. It was actually one study in a series of 21 studies, uh, and it was with college students. Um, college students make great research participants because we can give them extra credit, we can give them a $10 Starbucks gift card, and they're like, I'll do the study. This study was conducted by Dr. Timothy Wilson, the series of studies, a social psychologist at the University of Virg Virginia, Charlottesville. Students were recruited into the study. They were asked if they would be willing for a fee, we'd give them cash or gift card, um, to just sit in a room in a chair with nothing else, no book, no phone, um, and just sit with their own thoughts and do nothing for, let's say, up to 20 minutes. And the students are like, sign me up, right? I'll come sit in your laboratory room. They're like, I can do that. So the students arrived, and they sat in the chair. And, and then the researchers said, well, um, so if you'd like, while you're sitting there, you could administer a painful electric shock to yourself. Just, you know, if you'd like. And the students are like, well, why would I want to do that? I don't want to do that. Like, and that's not the actual shock machine. Um, they, the researchers didn't pu publish that. Um, and guess how long on average it took before the majority of the students sitting there doing nothing inflicted a painful electric shock to themselves. How many? 
five, ten, twelve? One minute and a half. <laughs> Someone said 30 seconds earlier today. I was like, oh, pessimist, is that what you said? Six minutes, on average. When you are addicted to stimulation, to feel something is better than feeling nothing. Feeling pain is a welcome substitute because at least you felt something. Remember that brain image? The zings and the likes and the retweets. Even among those students who said they would pay the money back to not have to feel the shock again after testing the shock, 25% of the women and 65% of the men gave themselves a zap when left to their own thoughts. One outlier pressed the button 190 times in 15 minutes. And as I always say as a researcher, we love the outliers, right? Because it gives us a little sense about, about humanity. Um, there's that slide again. I'm going to pass by this, even though it's really tempting to talk about. But we are going to, I want to conclude so that we can have some conversation. So two quick final points. The first is this. The inconvenient truth of this entire matter, of our current love affair with technology, is this. It's inconvenient because it's way easier in our lives to not do anything to change our habits, right? They're hard habits to change because to change them is going to require some pain, right? It, it's going to require for most of us some rewiring. It's going to require some resistance from our colleagues when we say we're not allowing technology into this meeting, that we're not allowing technology into this classroom, that we are asking for um, to show up and be fully present. Um, you might have seen or maybe you've been invited to a wedding where the participants, the, the grooms, the brides, the bride and the groom ask for all phones to be checked at the door into these little, you can actually hire a company now that you put your phone in a bag. You might have done this at a concert. I was at a comedian recently, I can't remember his name, he was really funny. Um, can't remember his name, where you put your phone in there and you, you, you can't a access it. Because it's, go it's hard for us to do this on our own. One little bit of homework, if you'd like a little more motivation, will be this talk. Dr. Robert Waldinger, I mentioned a little bit of his research earlier in the talk. This will motivate you. He is the fourth director of the longest running study on human um, happiness and adult development ever. And he has this brilliant, one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. It's affectionately known as the 75-year Harvard study. It's actually in year 82 or 83 now. He has collected, and the previous directors, tens of thousands of pages of data um, about why we must reevaluate our relationship with technology because our relationships with each other are those things that are going to add the most years to our lives. So the question is, whoops, we're what? gonna watch this, but we're not going to. What? The question is what works and what can we do? I'm gonna leave you with this. The two books that I highly recommend, if you are feeling motivated, two highly accessible books, um, and this combination, I think, is, is a killer combination in the best way. Cal Newport has written this book called Digital Minimalism. He's an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He's author, also the author of a book called Deep Work, how we can focus in our work. Um, he suggests that we um, reevaluate how we are using our digital technology. He, he has a 30-day strategy for a digital declutter. Basically, I'm gonna give you the quick summary, that you walk away from all of your optional digital tools in your life, and you spend 30 days figuring out what you really value. What do you really care about in your life? And then you only add back in the digital tools that strongly support 
those things that you identified that you value, that you care about. Digital minimalists, he describes, flip the storyline. They do not embrace the reality of using online tools to escape from the hard but fulfilling work of cultivating the meaningful life, but instead they figure out what they really value and then they work backwards to identify if there are any online, virtual, digital tools that can support those values. And then Dr. Turkle's book, the most recent one, the one that actually transformed the interpersonal communication class that I had taught for almost 30 years, I took everything aside and I said, this is what we need to be talking about. At the end of the semester, students would be literally on the last day in tears because they didn't know how, they, in their words, to go back out into the world where not everyone was as interested in reclaiming human conversation. They shared that they had, they felt like they were given a little magic key to being healthy and happy and back into themselves. Because one of the things that Dr. Turkle does, I sound like a Dr. Turkle fangirl, I kind of am. I got to meet her once, you should see if it wasn't, if I only had brought only a carry-on. I once met her and I had the book with all the little tabs and the notes and, the, and all the stuff and I was like, I love you and your book and I'm using it in my class. And she looked at it and she's like, I love this book. Um, but what she does is she addresses how digital technologies are disrupting this virtuous circle of contemplation, of self-reflection. Because without those pieces, what do we bring to others in conversation? I'll end with this. As she says, if we are not able to be alone, we will be lonely. Actually, I lied. I'm going to end with this comment. We must develop a more self-aware relationship with our digital vices. Because as I often ask myself, I ask my children, and I ask my students, with whom do you want to have your closest relationship? With another human or a device? Okay, thank you. We're going to shift now to some conversation and questions. Love seeing all your smiling faces, by the way. So we've got some questions coming in on Zoom. John Martin is going to um, manage those. So we thought we would toggle back and forth. We do one over here and one over here. And we are going to ask that you um, speak your question into the mic. Is that correct? Um, I'm going to try one with, uh, you know, it, it might be able to pick you up. Oh, it might be able to pick you up. If you uh, speak up, then you'll, you'll be with you. And I'll try to paraphrase it if it's a question that I can paraphrase so that our Zoom audience can hear. Comment, question. Uh, so thank I'll just stand up so I can project. Um, thank you very much. You persuaded me to get a wristwatch again because I the last one that broke, and then now I check my phone. So <laughs> that's a bad thing to do, and I'm going to get a watch. So thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. So a few a few years ago, I was teaching a, a like I had a no device policy, um, which sort of got people murmuring in hallways. So I was like, what is that guy doing? Um, because you're a professor. Yeah, exactly. So large class, which is where I had the policy, and it worked, and it was and it was welcomed. Um, but the reason I think it worked was because uh, I showed or I told the students about some research about the effects, the cognitive effect, effects of taking notes by hand. And I won't go into all of it, but basically, when you, you when you do by hand, you use your own words. So. My colleagues were asking me, like, well, the no device policy, that must be pretty unpopular. I said, no, I showed them the research that suggests when you write out your notes by hand, you, you do better in tests. So it was like a, the only student who objected to me personally to the policy said, but sir, you don't understand. I'm addicted to my device. I'm addicted <laughs> to my laptop. And I said, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. So um, you used the word addiction tonight. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you want to elaborate a little bit as to whether you think this is a real addiction or do we just use that as a metaphor? Yeah, that's a great question. To your first example, really quickly, I use a similar strategy with my students. On day one, we read a piece. Before we do anything else besides introduce ourselves, or I introduce, I'm like, this is this class and I'm this person. If you're in the wrong room, you know, you might want to go. I have them read a piece. 
and, and it shifts them, right? They're not all fully bought in, but I love that notion, right? To the, this is the why, right? So I've listened to so many um, interviews with Dr. Turkle and others who are cutting edge researchers on this topic. And this question is often asked, is this a real addiction? And it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting question and it's a complex answer. For some people, it is. And one of the very challenging things for us as we reevaluate our use and we find new ways of getting those dopamine hits that we get from whatever use, right? Uh, like whether it's Instagram, like I love the Instagram story, right? I'm like, oh, oh, e. um, is how we shift right? Like any kind of addiction. I mean, they're, they're all different. I'm not an addiction expert, but how they are, or if they are these devices and our use of them, if they are significantly negatively impacting our lives, that's something to be assessed by a professional. Um, one of the one of the things I can say is that one of the challenges with digital addiction like gaming addiction, spending hours and hours and hours scrolling Twitter, right? Because we, we know that, and actually I'm gonna back this up so you can see this other book. Oh, sorry. Um, this is another great book, and I didn't have time to get into this, but this book by Adam Alter called Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. We know that tech companies have designed this technology to get us hooked and keep us hooked, even by the colors they use. There's a reason he used yellow, right? And you can read the book to find out. That they have figured out, they actually have people like me, social scientists who study this on their staff, to figure out what is it that can keep you at it, Snapchat streaks, for instance, you'll read about it in his book, wow, how we are wired as humans. And one of the things that is challenging about the bits of addiction, right, for some of us, worse than others, is that, for instance, if you have an addiction to drugs or alcohol, you don't, and you're in recovery, you don't drink alcohol or take drugs. But how many of us can even buy a car that doesn't have a computer baked in? How many of us can get a job that doesn't require that we log into something, that doesn't require that we are on email, right? So we have to figure out how to navigate it. But I would, I would point you to, this is a great resource, and Turkle addresses it in, in a little more sophisticated ways in her book. But I, I don't use the term lightly. Mm -hmm. Great question. John, do we have one? We do. We have an online question. Might the shift to less empathy be a good thing, a corrective to an over-empathic culture as per Paul Bloom's Yale analysis? Perhaps it's a technological shift that improves the quality of our identity? I think that person needs to come do a lecture. <laughs> That, it, that is a really interesting question, a really good question. I have a, this is gonna be a hard one to answer in a short period of time. Um, oh, I don't think we can get into the complexities, into the weeds here about what too much empathy means. I have a hard time with that argument. Um, I'm also living in the United States of America. Part of why I don't want to go back, right, is because we have an empathy crisis. We have a crisis of humanity, of, and it, it's, it's disheartening. It, it breaks my heart every day to see neighbors fighting with each other because of yard signs, right? Of, P of families breaking apart because they no longer, they won't talk to one another because we are so divided. We're either red state or blue state, black, white, brown, this or that. It can't be both. Um, to the question of empathy, 
I'm sure there are ways and times we can be too empathic. That means we lose ourselves completely. Um, I guess I'm not there yet. I'm more worried about the majority of people who, whose empathy has diminished, who are feeling compassion fatigue. I think about you know, the news cycle, and we see what's going on in Ukraine, and how many of us have become a little bit, right? The next school shooting in the US, it's like, oh, well, there are only four people, right? Like, we're fatigued. That worries me. Probably not a great answer to that brilliant question, but tell the person to send me a note. I'd love to hear more. Any a question out here? Yeah. Um, so I have a question and then a comment. Okay. Um, my question, um, I understand that I'm maybe digging into your personal life a bit, so please don't speak to this if you don't want to, but I'm very curious how all of this translates in your role as a parent. And um, I understand that your children are now older and maybe because they're you know, on separate sides of the country, it's a little more difficult to control them and they are older, but maybe how um, their relationship with technology and their relationship with technology and you as a parent and your spouse, how that just occurred yeah. when they were teenagers. Yeah, what a great question. If you couldn't hear it, how has all this impacted how I parented, how my husband and I parented? Should I answer it and then you do your comment? Yeah. Um, I'll try to make this super brief. Um, I love what I do. I think w there's no better job in the world, one, to get to be around college students all the time, right? And we live on a college campus now. Um, but also, because of what I study. Um, if my husband were here, he would tell you he's the l tallest human communication guinea pig ever. Our marriage is a Petri dish. He gets a year and a half of credit for every year served because he's married to a marriage researcher, <laughs> right? I love it because every day, Right, I'm consuming this, and the, the, the side benefit is that I can make more informed choices as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, as a daughter. Not always the best choices, but at least I'm sure. So as parents, we tried to walk the walk, and it was really challenging um, in, at, at many times because our son, Tony, who's now 26, um, went to Stanford University, majored in computer science. He's a tech entrepreneur. He came out of my womb coding. He came out of my womb looking at cords and lights. His first word was actually hose, like a garden hose, because he thought it was an electrical cord. We're driving along and he looked out the window and he's like, hose. <laughs> I know. He's, and so he, had his, he launched his first business in second grade, Tony's techhelp.com. I still have his business cards. I would drop people off or drop him off at our friends' homes and he would set up their technology and go to the Apple store. Like that was his favorite um, field trip. And so I was really worried. And I think it actually fueled maybe some of my interest, my early interest in studying this. I actually took my sewing room and I put it next to his screens, right? And it was about monitoring and nurturing, right? Our job as parents and teachers, it's challenge and support, challenge and support. And so we were not a tech-free home. Um, if I were parenting young people right now, I would absolutely make it a zero technology for children um, until probably age five. Um, the argument that I don't want my child to fall behind. We know enough now. If I was going to engage in technology with children, if I had young children, I would do it with them. Right? The research is clear that like, if you're going to watch a show with a child to do it or let them watch a show to do it with them and have conversation and that there are better shows, slower shows that are showing complexity and human emotion. Um, yeah, so we didn't do it perfectly and I, I don't want any parent or grandparent ever to be like, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing so I'm not going to do anything at all. Right? We have to be the parents in the room. Our children want us to be. We need the grandparents to put down the iPads. Right? That's what our grandchildren are asking. We need our nannies and our caregivers to not be pushing the stroller and be looking at a phone. 
right? Because we know the blank face phenomenon is actually really destructive to babies. We need this information for nursing mothers, for instance, who are, are giving their babies as much eye contact as possible because that's how brains are being wired. So anyway, what was your comment? My comment is a reflection on your note about how much time passes in the morning um, before you check your phone. And I think you said for most people it was less than five less minutes. Less than five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that one of my greatest joys is when I get to go home to my parents who live in a different city. They live in Chilliwack. And my sister still lives at home because I feel like I don't have to check my phone or I don't have to talk to anybody because, you know, just for info, the only people I talk to technologically are my mom, my dad, my sister. I don't have a significant other at this time, so it's just the three of them. And the rest of, like me and my other late 20 year old friends, we're also concerned because most of my friends are educators, so we don't really text. We just, you know, say, I'll meet you this day, and then we go out for drinks. So I have no one to talk to other than my family. But when I'm with my family, I don't have anyone to talk to, so I don't ever have to be on my phone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really interesting how, like, I guess I've done like a self-study because you know when I go home for Easter in a couple of weeks, it's like that's great. That's two days where I'm not going to touch my phone because who else am I going to talk to? Mm -hmm. So it's it's really interesting. I I mean it it maybe it begs the question of do I need to do personal work on more independence of not having to talk to my parents at lunchtime and dinner? I don't know. I love them. That's just what it is. But it's. Yeah, it's just fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful reflection, right? To, to notice when you are finding those bits of joy. And, you know, we talked with the students at the noon hour about this notion of balance, and, and I didn't fully get to, to this discussion, but I think balance in any way is a myth, right? The balance of work life balance. We don't ever get to a place and then are static, right? Like I like to think about marriage and family relationships as a lifelong conversation. And if we come into each conversation thinking or taking the stance that it's a practice, that I might not do it perfectly this time, but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna keep practicing, I think it's a beautiful analogy for how we engage our devices, right? There are phases in my life where I find like I'm sitting on the plane and I'm like, wait a second, what I could be doing instead is meditating or praying or right, doing something else or maybe talk to the person next to me. What do you know? Right? Like engaging in, in actual human conversation. But it's a practice and it starts with us being aware. So thank you for sharing that. We have a lot of excellent questions. Oh boy. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to all of them, and so I uh, let people know that they can email them to me, and I'll pass them on uh, oh, awesome. to you excellent. if we're not able to answer them all Excuse here. Me. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Do you have any suggestions particular to teenagers to help them examine their tech phone habits in the face of peer pressure? That is, when all their friends and classmates are obsessed with their phones, and it's essentially a requirement of fitting in. That is a tough one, right? This notion of advice for teenagers. Um, you know, there are a lot of great resources out there for parents to work with their teens. Um, one of the books I love is called The Parent Compass. And it's a, it's a beautiful way to think about the ways that we as parents are working with our teens to provide this compass for them, to not be the helicopter, the snowplow parent, or whatever analogy you want to use, but, but to help them develop their own compass, right? And so I think it's absolutely essential as we're working with teens to to keep reminding them and showing them that they have agency, right? And so to give them, to remind them, to lift them up and to, 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 um, to empower them. Say, hey, these, these might be some uncomfortable conversations, but what if, right? What if you became the leader in your group of influence and, and you propose a fun, new way to just for one lunch hour hey what if we had you know we each brought a different 
topic of conversation and we put our phones in our backpacks or, you know, you create it and, and give them these little wins. But I think that Parent Compass, and there's a whole host of other resources out there um, that I think parents should lean on. Yeah. I think we have time for, for one more. Yeah, we've, it's 829. Oh, yeah, you had your hand up before. Um, thank you for the You're really interesting. I wanted to ask about uh, whether you have any guidance for people, especially as we're interacting with those more on a peer level, if we ourselves are only responsible or in control of our own use of technology. If you're not a parent that can control what your kid does, or not a professor that can set rules for a class, but even just in interactions with your friends, your family members, whether that's siblings, parents, whoever, like, how can we go about trying to encourage more meaningful face-to-face -face conversation mm -hmm. and call people out on technology use in a graceful way when we're all struggling with the technology addiction as well? Um, yeah. I'm just curious if you have done research around this or yeah. advice to give. I love the question. Peer influence, right? Here's what I believe to be true as a social scientist. We are contagious, right? Our energy is, is contagious. We, our behaviors influence others. It's actually, I, I love the question, it's bringing us full circle. So for instance, how we choose to behave and engage and show up in a company and be in conversation, it might not be immediate, but it will change others' behaviors. Right, and so, I mean, coming in hot, right, is usually not the way to do it. So calling people out, be like, hey, you know, like Auntie Kelly, if, I don't know if you're watching Auntie Kelly, but my oldest sister-in-law, Auntie Kelly, we call, the, all the grand, the nieces and nephews would call her Kellycopter. She was a third grade teacher. At family holidays, she would be the one who'd go around and be like, phones away, and if you're not going to, I'm putting it in my Kelly pocket, right in here. And, uh, most of us can't do that, right? And so what we can do is in those spaces where we do have agency, where we, where we are, let's say, the peer, we can say out loud things like, you know what? I'm going to leave my phone in my bag because I just read this really interesting book. Actually, maybe we should have a book club. It, was, it changed the way I see the world. And, right? So you start to behave differently, you start to make comments about your change in behavior, what you've learned, how you feel, sleep differently, how you behave differently, and it starts to catch on. And as people show interest, then like, I love, like you dole out a little bit, just a little bit of information, like, hey, I just watched this fascinating TED talk. Um, so I, I'd say that that is one of the most powerful ways Right, and to, to be creative, like let's say you are going out with your friends. You know, there's all sorts of ideas that people have out there about like, okay, here's the rule, the dinner rule, we're all gonna put our phones in the middle of the table off, whoever rings first picks up the bill. Right, like all these ways to make it fun and then it opens dialogue as well. Like, well, why are we gonna do that? How's this, right? Um, and I love that you're even asking the question because again, it's you young people who give me the most hope. Um, I will end with one more book recommendation and it's related to your question. So a journalist by the name of Amy Sutherland um, wrote this New York Times piece probably 10 years ago now that went viral. And it was, and then she wrote a book as a follow-up um, and it's called What Shamu Taught Me About Life, Love and Marriage. Shamu the Whale. What Shamu took. So she spent a year following exotic animal trainers and she was writing some pieces about it. And all of a sudden she realized like, well, maybe some of what their techniques are would work on my husband and my children. <laughs> and basically it was ignore what you want less of, reward what you want more of, right? So for instance, what I try to do, and I hope my children aren't watching, although they know all this, because I talk about it at the dinner table all the time, is you catch people doing what you want more of and you compliment them. That little bit of affirmation, like, thanks so much for you know, not checking your phone during our conversation. That was so meaningful. Like, I really, I felt really connected to you. 
saying that to your spouse, your partner, or your grandchild. Um, saying out loud, like, hey, when I pick you up from school, I've made it my decision. I'm going to make sure that my phone is always tucked away in the glove compartment. And I really appreciate how you, you know, don't read your book on the way home or whatever, right? Reward what you want more of, ignore what you want less of. And over time, we all come to do more of the things that make us better in relationship. Anyway, I know we're out of time. Thank you all for being here. snacks yes there are snacks um, and conversation. but first of all thank you. thank you it's really wonderful my only regret is that this is not filled with people because there are hundreds and thousands of people who um, need to hear this including me and I think one of the things that makes a talk so challenging is when you realize it hits home right and it's like how do I incorporate this in my life how do I make this a part of my life? And so I thank you for that. So one thing, maybe a little more homework now. Oh, now now I'm in that do mode. Uh, let people know about the Center for Christian Engagement, what we're doing here. Let them know about this kind of conversation, this kind of talk. People at home, you as well. Um, and you'll be able to find this talk on our YouTube channel. So we can keep passing it along and passing it along and more and more people can hear it. But I'm really thankful that you're here. And folks, I know that there are reasons to be at home, but if you can make it down here, you do get snacks and you get, you get to talk in person to our speakers. So please uh, join us afterwards. And one more time, let's thank Carol Brees. Oh.